Hello, thank you for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. I'm Dr. David Pendergrass. You know, I get uh, tweets from people from time to time and responding to my uh, Twitter account, and it's interesting to me because I, you never know what you're going to get. A lot of them are encouraging. Some are uh, challenges and so forth, and that's interesting. But getting the responses to my Twitter account always reminds me of how it doesn't really matter what you say. You're going to be misunderstood, and that's just what happens. And and people have different opinions as well. That's that's great. But it's disappointing uh, for a person like myself. And if you're listening to this, you might be this way too. When you try your very best to nuance something and to say what you are trying to communicate, and then the person completely misunderstand it. And that's just how it goes in communication. I'm just sharing my feelings with you. I'm talking to you like a trusted friend. For example, one guy the other day said he had a long response to one of my podcasts on why scientists don't talk about God. And I give this long analogy in my podcast about how the universe is like a house and where scientists can examine the house all they want and discover how it works. But scientists don't have to talk about where the house came from to learn about how the house works. And I gave examples of how this very, very preeminent scientist who works at MIT says that they can talk about science all day long and not talk about whether or not there is a God because they don't have to talk about God to figure out how the universe works. And I said, of course not. Well, the person on Twitter responds back and says, I'm either lying or I'm, what well, I'm, I'm either lying or I'm being delusional or something. That is, scientists uh, don't talk about who designed the house because there's no evidence for him or her. Now, you can listen to the podcast. There's a whole podcast that explains how what I, what he just said doesn't make any sense at all and how I respond to that. That is to say, I mean, I make it very, very clear in my analogy, I say it explicitly over and over, that the God that the average theist believes in, in my analogy, say the person who designed the house, is not made of the house. It's not made of the house. So God is not made of rock or energy or matter. And so therefore, you cannot ever find scientific evidence. So I'm not sure if the person on Twitter actually listened to the podcast or listened to a few minutes of it and just stopped ignored me because he was so mad because I disagreed with him. I don't know, but it reminds me of something C.S. Lewis said when people responded to his book, Miracles. He said in one of his articles, uh, when his, he, wrote, he wrote to a newspaper to respond to one of his critics, and he said, I'm not sure how many times I have to say the exact opposite of a thing before I'm accused of it. So the point is, I said, and C.S. Lewis said over and over and over, miracles are not violations of the laws of nature, but yet everyone accused him of saying that. So my point is, I kind of feel some affinity in my little pity party right now with C.S. Lewis. That is to say, I wonder how many times you have to say the exact opposite of something <laughs> before you're not accused of that very thing. So even my analogy of the house, uh, the guy comes back and says, here's all the reasons why, David, you're wrong, and he gives evidence. And I addressed all of those reasons in my analogy. The other day, I also got a long response by an atheist, and his name is Matt. And I hate saying it that way, by the way, because I hate, Matt's not an atheist, Matt's a human being. <laughs> he just, he, he happens to disbelieve, disbelieve in God, and that's okay, uh, we just disagree. And I'm, I'm just telling you the truth, I hate, I hate, uh, you know, so-and-so is a Christian or a theist or the atheist, because then it, it limits a person down to just their belief or disbelief in something, and I think that's just, I guess, unkind. I'm a Christian, so I think it's unkind and a bit unhelpful. Because that's a mouthful when you say the word atheist. It's a mouthful when you say the word Christian or skeptic or Muslim or whatever. Because people have different beliefs. And I want to take just a few minutes to respond to some of the things he sent to me in a real long email. I, um, I, I followed him on Twitter and he followed me back, I think. But anyway, he responded back and said, you know, David, you can follow me. Uh, just understand that religion is uh, used for the power hungry, basically. I don't remember the exact quote. It's for the powerful. God doesn't exist, and Jesus is a fiction. And so I wrote back and said, well, that's thank you. That's good to know. And then he wrote back and said something I could not believe he said. He apologized and said, I'm sorry if that sounded, I don't remember now, rude or mean or something. There's only so much you can do in 140 characters. What I was surprised is I've never, I know they exist. I know that. I've just never, ever heard or met ever an atheist who apologized for coming across as rude. Usually they revel in it and it makes them very happy. So I was thought that, well, this is great. And I thought maybe we can have a good conversation because I like good conversations. So I told him on Twitter, I mean, I'm with you. 140 characters isn't much. But if you ever wanted to read my book um, or correspond via email, we could do that. And it wasn't a sales pitch. It was just say, usually when I have these dialogues with atheists, and I've had many, many dialogues with atheists, 
usually uh, we cover so much ground that I've already covered in a book. And uh, in fact, that's one of the times in the past I've even offered to send them a free copy because I'm not trying to just get a few dollars, which is all you make, by the way. When you sell a book on Amazon, you just make a few bucks. Anyway, so all that to say, he wrote uh, two really long emails in response to what looks like, it looks like he quickly skimmed over chapter one of my book. And I want to make a couple reflections of his long emails to me. I won't go line by line, but I just want to make a few comments about that. The first thing I'd say is this, and this is difficult to do because you haven't read the emails. Several things that he does in his email, which is real short, and it's it's curt and very, very dismissive of almost everything I say and what he, uh, things of what I say and some things I don't even say. He's very dismissive, very, very quickly dismissive of those things. And okay, that's what happens. But the first point I want to make here, especially if you're a Christian and you're listening to this, what I encourage you to do is don't do what, don't ever, don't ever do what Matt did to me. Please, if you're a Christian particularly, if you're not a Christian, then there's, you have no ethical system or maybe you do and whatever, but the Christian worldview is not authoritative for you. So what I'm saying is irrelevant. But if you're a Christian, I speak on behalf of the teachings of Jesus to say that it's very, very unkind and you're going to hurt your chances to build a relationship with a person if you discount what they believe immediately without listening carefully what it is they're saying. You're just going to ruin your cause. Another thing that's related to that point, I guess point A and point B would be at the same point. That is, several times in his emails, he says basically, no, 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 David, you can't think that, or Dr. Pendergast, you can't believe that because... Your Bible, your Bible says, won't, won't let you believe that kind of stuff. For example, example, I talked about unicorns and fairies. And he says, here you seem to get a, get muddle, get in a muddle, I, I guess because he's British, the muddle, I guess is confused maybe is the word for Americans. I don't know. He says, fairies and unicorns are magical beings. And I'm pretty sure the Bible has a lot to say about the perils of believing in that sort of nonsense. So it's interesting that you're willing to accept the possibility of their existence, despite your religion being against it. But you're not even willing to concede that other religions may be equally valid because the Bible forbids it. Now, well, my point here is, Rod's point B is, not only is he it quickly, easily dismissive of several of my points, which doesn't help him, too, he assumes what I believe. And so this is my encouragement, particularly if you're a Christian, if you're trying to talk to a person who's a non-believer, do your very, very, very best not to label them right away like atheist or skeptic and then no longer listen to them. Oh, you're just like everybody else. Just don't do that like he's done to me here, because if we had the time, if Matt really knew me, he'd realize that he doesn't know enough about the Bible to tell me what the Bible says and doesn't say. And and that's a big point. That's not like a problem where it's a challenge to my pride or something. It's just a big point. I have an undergraduate degree, a master's degree, and a PhD. And my PhD is almost two major specialties, a New Testament and historical theology. I had to learn three ancient languages and three modern languages just to be able to get my degrees. I'm a specialized historian and theologian. And when someone who doesn't even follow my religion, who does not have 12 years of graduate specialized degree education in the field, tells me what's in my Bible and what I should believe, it demonstrates a kind of profound hubris, I guess, hubris, arrogance, I don't know what it is or assumption or presumption that if you're a Christian, you're talking to a non-believer. I'm begging you, please don't ever do it that way. Don't ever, ever, ever do it that way. It's okay to assume that another person, especially they have 12, 12 years of specialist study. Uh, it's okay to assume they're not idiots. It's okay to assume that. I mean, Richard Dawkins, who's a well-known atheist, he might be not the most competent philosopher there is, but the guy's a smart guy. And I give him due credit for that. Christopher Hitchens, who wasn't a PhD, I don't think he was a PhD, but he's a really smart guy. Sam Harris, PhD, smart guy. I mean, a lot of atheists, and at least well-known atheists and skeptics, these are smart people. And so we don't want to dismiss them out of hand because they fall into a certain category called atheist. Therefore, they're all delusional or stupid or whatever. That's not going to help you at all. And I tell you what, when I read these kinds of things, of course, because I'm an emotional person as well, it sure makes me not want to have a conversation. In fact, that's what I told one of my emails. I appreciate it, but I can see that it's not going to help me go line by line to respond to all these things. So my, my tip number one is, if you're a Christian particularly, and you're trying to talk to a non-Christian about your faith, number one is, don't dismiss them out of hand. Don't assume, and secondly, don't assume they're ignorant just because they disagree with you. Don't assume you know more about their view than they do. 
So what are you supposed to do instead of assuming? You're supposed to do one simple thing, and it's this. Ask. Ask the person what they believe and listen carefully. You're not trying to just find a way to disagree with them and jump on them and say, oh, it's all stupid, whatever. You're genuinely listening. If you don't genuinely listen, what you're going to do is you're going to peg them with everybody else that fits your predetermined category, and you're, there's no possible way you're going to have a, a fruitful conversation if and when that happens. All right, that's a big deal. So my first big point is do your best not to be dismissive and certainly don't categorize them and think they're dumb just because they disagree with you. That's not going to help your cause. My second big thing is this. There are a few of these points. The first thing he brings up is, is early in my book. In my book, I say this. I say on page two, in fact, when the skeptic asks me, why do you believe in Christianity and Jesus of Nazareth and God and so forth? This person says, why? And I say this, quote, this is from my book, quote, there's a whole bunch of reasons, really, but the thing that matters the most to me is, and I know this might sound strange or cheesy, my relationship with Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus have changed. Jesus has changed my life. So what Matt responds to me is, this is what Matt says, you believe in Jesus because of your relationship with him. This is circular reasoning. Now, already I can tell Matt didn't read my paragraph. What I said was, there are many reasons I believe in the truth claims of Christianity. The one that matters the most to me is my relationship with him. But anyway, so he's already misread it, which I know right away he's not reading me carefully, and that's bothersome. But then he goes on and this, Matt says this. Matt says, in order to have a relationship with Jesus, you must believe in him. So supporting your belief in this fashion is essentially saying, I believe in him because I believe in him. Now to that I say, surely Matt, in a moment's reflection, you would see that's nonsense. If you ask me, David, why do you believe your, your wife exists? Why do you believe in your marriage? And I could say there are a lot of reasons, really. But the one that matters the most to me is I have a relationship with her. Now, if Matt tells me my relationship with my wife can't count as evidence that my wife exists, then surely we don't have a conversation anymore. Surely it doesn't matter because it seems to me all normal common sense approach to reason and logic has been thrown out the window. Surely my experience of my wife has to count toward evidence that she exists. If Matt were to say, no, David, what are other reasons? Because there's no way you can trust your experience. Then I'm going to say, well, all kinds of other reasons, I guess. I have pictures of her. I have kids by her. I have a social security number, whatever. And then we're back to the rest of my chapter on that same book, which is you can make up any reason. You could, you can make up those papers. Those kids could be adopted. You could be a liar. You could be delusional. In other words, anything I give to you is not going to be evidence. So it's not circular reasoning to say that my experience of Jesus is actually evidence that it's true. If I met Jesus and I have met him, if I've met him on a spiritual level, that's evidence he exists. It's just evidence. So, but again, this is another evidence of not reading or I guess thinking clearly about what I actually said. Then he goes on for a while and there are a lot of things he says he quotes me and the skeptic in the book. And he says, quote, you could be delusional. And he calls this a straw man or ad hominem. And, and, uh, and I, he says that I make the skeptic sound stupid and I'm clever by knocking him down and that the skeptic's just a gullible idiot and so forth. And, and, the, and I would have, there's several points in his email. I would just say, Matt, I, I, brother, I don't know what else to say besides I profoundly disagree with you. I have met and read and heard many atheists and skeptics say you're just delusional. I remember one time in particular, there was a thing, and this happens all the time. I'm just saying the first thing that comes to my mind is a, a, a YouTube clip. Richard Dawkins gave a long presentation. A guy comes up to him after the presentation and says, what would you say, Richard, or Professor Dawkins, to a person who's experienced Jesus for 40 years, who's been a constant source of hope and encouragement and guidance and wisdom for me for 40 years? And Richard said, well, I would say the person's delusional. Now, this isn't, Matt says this is ad hominem or straw man and the gullible just, the scepter is just an idiot. That's not an idiot at all. It's a common expression. In fact, Sigmund Freud thought the person who believed in God to be delusional. He said it was a neurosis brought on by childhood issues. So these are kind of examples where Matt might think the person's not delusional to believe in God. Okay, Matt, then you do not. 
But many atheists and skeptics and agnostics think believers are, in fact, delusional. But because Matt disagrees with that view, he thinks I'm right making the skeptic to be an idiot. And I don't think the skeptic is an idiot. I think that's a very good question. I myself have asked that question. David, you could be delusional. You know that, right? I have pondered the exact same question. I think that's a very good, fair question. And so forth. And then he says several things here. He knocks off back to back to back of examples. For example, quote, uh, the origin of multiple constants throughout the universe. Now, this leads into what's sometimes called the fine-tuning argument. Matt dismisses that very quickly. This is what Matt says uh, when it comes to the fine-tuning. A decent background in physics knocks that on the head easily. But even without that, this is still simply an assertion of your belief and not itself an argument. The two things about that, let me start at the end. It's not an assertion of my belief that there are constants. This is absolute standard belief amongst every astrophysicist I've ever read, ever, and ever heard. I mean, ever. This is a very common belief, and it's not an argument. I agree. In fact, had Matt read my book, (laughs) had he read it and had he read it carefully, he would know that I say repeatedly in my book, it's not an argument. It's not an argument. Um, Multiple fine-tuning elements of the universe is not an argument for God. I call it something I think just points to God. That's not an argument. People do make an argument, but I don't think it's an argument. I just think it points to God. That's all. I think it's one of the many things. But my second point is when he says a decent background of physics knocks that on the head easily. And then later on, later on, Matt critiques um, me again. Now, this is important. Later on, um, in my book, the skeptic says, in my book, the book, the skeptic says, but science has solved all that. And Matt calls this a straw man. And he says, quote, again, your skeptic is proving to be an intellectual failure. You've had to make another fatuous point so you can knock it off and claim a victory. Now, these points are responded. Now, my skeptic in the book says science has solved all that. But Matt himself just said a decent background in physics knocks that on the head easily. In other words, Matt is saying exactly what my skeptic says in the book. But when I do that, when the skeptic says in the book, Matt says that's a fatuous, stupid argument. And Matt is committing the very crime that he's saying I'm committing. That is to say, science solves all that. It's over. Next. Well, I guess my point there is, Matt, it sure seems hypocritical. (laughs) It sure seems very hypocritical that when the skeptic says it in my book, it's bad. But when you say it, you're reasonable. To that, I would say, number two, I would say, Matt, buddy... We might just disagree on what the evidence points toward, and I'm okay with that. In my book, I say that over and over and over. You don't have to see it my way. It just seems to me that the scientific facts are fairly not debatable. There are some scientists who don't debate fine-tuning. I mean, they don't agree with fine-tuning. That's true. But many, 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 many do. And I don't think that's big of a... I mean, the consensus is is overwhelming uh, fine-tuning of the universe. Where we disagree is not on that. Where we disagree, perhaps, is where it points. The average atheist says it points to nowhere. The average atheist, particularly naturalist, says we just don't know or one day we're going to figure it out. That is a possible answer. I say that in my book. In my book, I say you could just say that. I'm just saying that based on a bunch of other reasons why I think it's likely it points to the existence of a fine-tuner if it is fine-tuned. And these kind of things go on and on. Uh, for example, he says... He Matt attacks my origin of morality. He says morality is a social construct, not a universal truth. It's partly arrived at by the consensus and partly derived from a desire not to hurt anyone. This desire does not require the presence of a supreme being. And he says it's pretty much hardwired into our brains and has been studied at length via the mathematical abstraction of game theory. And what is morally right is not fixed, either in time or by geography. There are no more absolutes. There are no moral absolutes. Now, everything he said there in this paragraph, I address you might imagine, in the book. And I show why these are not good reasons. But I wonder when he says there are no moral absolutes, I wonder if I would ask the question, Matt, is it right or good to believe in your view? Is it right to believe that there are no moral absolutes? And if he said, yes, it's right, I'm going to say, Matt, so you're saying it's wrong to hold my view? He's going to say, yes, it's wrong. Okay, Matt, why? where does this concept of right and wrong come from? If there are no moral absolutes, but you're making an absolute claim, how is that possible? But secondly, I'd say he's described 
what we call moral epistemology, how we get to know right and wrong. And that is not the point at all. Morality has to be grounded in something, or whether it's just relativism. So when he says it's hardwired in our brain, that's irrelevant. If it's been studied versus in mathematical abstraction, that's irrelevant. If he thinks it's arrived by consensus, that's also irrelevant. If he says it's derived from a desire not to hurt anyone, that's all irrelevant. I could say the same thing about mathematics. Why do you think mathematics is objectively true? 2 plus 2 equals 4 if you're Asian, African, white. It doesn't matter. Why is that? Well, David, it's not. It's not objective. 2 plus 2 is 4 for you and your culture. It's, it's because it's, but, it's, but for me, it's 5. It's all relative. Why is it relative? Because it's partly arrived at consensus. It's partly derived to desire and understand the world, blah, blah, blah. The point is, I can easily argue that because mathematics are taught by teachers, because it's passed down by parents, because some people get their math wrong and some people get it quote-unquote right, it's all just relative. Well, that's nonsense. That is to say, because it is taught, because some people get it wrong, because some people understand it more than others, because more people have a consensus of mathematics than others do, it doesn't make mathematics relative at all. Mathematics are still objectively right. Or objectively wrong as to say true or false true or false so but again I address these issues in my book and I'll just be so interested if people like Matt and Matt if you're listening we could read it carefully and listen to the arguments to see if you understand the point that me and most theists are making and it's not this it is not that you have to believe in God to be moral person it's that if there is no God then there's no reason to understand morality as right or wrong. Morality is just preference. It's not good to save innocent human life. It's just what you prefer. What Hitler did to the Nazi, uh, through the Jews and the gypsies wasn't wrong. It's just I don't prefer it. If you say it was wrong, if the Nazis had even won, what if they had won and Germany had won the war and now controlled all of Europe? I would still say it's objectively wrong to eradicate a people group. I don't care where the power is held and so forth. Well, I'm not going to say more about that because why? I wrote an entire chapter on it. Let me finish on this last thing because this is where I was most disappointed in Matt because Matt seems to be a bright guy and, and uh, a little witty and I like that. I like bright people. I like witty people. This is the last thing I'll say about this because um, he says, quote, this is, he's quoting me, Christianity has the most historical evidence. That's because that's what David, that's what I believe. He says, first, there is no evidence that Jesus was the son of God. To that I say, there is evidence that points to a divine origin. Now, I have evidence for that because I have wrote a whole chapter on it, but he hasn't read the chapter, so he doesn't know that. So when he says there is no evidence, to that I say, Matt, you're just mistaken. My three degrees and my PhD, particularly in historic, and, uh, and my historical work of the early church, demonstrates you're just mistaken. You're wrong. He says there's no evidence for that, and there's the, or there was even a single person. He says, in fact, Jesus. There's a lot of evidence. There's a lot of evidence support that Jesus is just a. Um, he's a he a character of a hodgepodge of pre-existing folklore based heavily on pre-Christian mythology. Now that's where I was so disappointed. So far, a lot of this was the same old kind of stuff I've read before, but this was so disappointing because. No scholar, I mean, no one in scholarship would suggest what he just suggested. I mean, nobody. Jewish historians, atheistic uh, historians, Christian historians, Muslim historians, nobody thinks this. I know it's popular on YouTube. I know there's one or two authors out there who's writing books, but zero people in the guild, in the academy, who have fully functioning jobs in the field of historical studies of the ancient world would ever suggest that Jesus didn't exist. He's just, he's just part of mythology. And that's so disappointing that people like Matt, who seem intelligent, still would support this kind of profound nonsense. It's just, it's just absurd. And I don't have the time right now to go into it, but again, this is, 12 years of study in the academy and numerous, I mean, th I've read thousands of books. I've read all the arguments. There's more evidence that Jesus existed, a real Jesus of Nazareth existed and was killed in a Roman time, than there is evidence for any emperor 
in the entire Roman Empire. Now, that says something. It says a lot to me also about Matt to say that it's nothing but a hodgepodge of basic mythology. It's so disappointing to think that people even say these kinds of things anymore. And I can't believe they still get hits on YouTube, but that's a different story. Anyway, there's a lot of stuff like that. Just glosses over very, very quickly. And that's it. So I wrote back and said, thanks so much. He wrote back and said uh, he supposes that atheists like theists, theists come in a lot of different sizes. And he, he's done a whole lot of research. And he says, uh, he says a few times ago, in fact, he's read a whole lot of religious works. He says part of that, quote, know thy enemy kind of thing. And so forth. And he says how much he doesn't like Dawkins. He calls him an insufferable donkey. <laughs> he says he thinks Dawkins give atheists everywhere a bad name. Well, I think so too. But anyway, this last point is this. And when he says it twice, uh, I think it's twice his emails, when Matt tells me it's sort of the know your enemy approach. To that, I want to say, Matt, brother, you're not my enemy. I understand your point. I get your point. It's like the opposite view. I get it. I know. I know it's, you probably just mean that colloquially speaking. But Matt, you're not my enemy. Atheists are not my enemy. Skeptics are not my enemy. You're just not. You're just not. You're a fellow human being, I guess on your view, where you're a fellow developed primates, homo sapiens. Okay, I'll start with that. <laughs> In either case, we're not enemies, for crying out loud. We're two different people who have different views on something, and that's okay to have different views. I just wish we could have good conversations sometimes with people who disagree without being dismissed so quickly uh, and sometimes even so hatefully, but that's a different day, different time. Anyway, God bless you, Matt, on the other side of the planet. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. If you have any questions for me about my book, I encourage you to go read it. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for listening to A Glimpse of the Kingdom. If you would like to ask me a question, contact me on Twitter at Dr. D. Pendergrass, at Dr. D. Pendergrass, and I'll do my best to address your question sometime on the air. And if not, it uh, doesn't mean I don't like you. It just means I didn't have a chance to get to it. So let me know what your questions are. If you want more theological reflection, go to davidpendergrass.com. If you want more information about what I do in consulting, leadership consulting and consulting for churches, and also my marriage workshop, go to davidpendergrassconsulting.com.